Welcome to another episode of the Rock Fantasy Files with a uh, special guest, Tommy Stewart from Hollow's Eve. Hollow's Eve means a lot to Rock Fantasy just because when I opened in like 1985, early 86, I guess, I don't really remember exact time period they were there, but they were our first ever in-store hang with a national act. And uh, as I revisited their music the last couple of days, it was, it's just such great stuff listening to Tales of Terror and Death and Insanity, which I've done the last couple of days. So uh, John McAtee has put this episode together. So I'm going to have him introduce everyone and get the show started. Thanks, John, for putting this together today. Uh, my pleasure. It's t totally awesome. I'm a huge uh, Hollow's Eve fan, so it's definitely an honor. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, yeah, I have Tommy here from Hollow's Eve. So I mean, that's a you know, we're really happy to have you here. And thank you so much for, you know, doing this. It means Absolutely. a lot to us. I love doing this stuff. Yeah. And, and all, all the fans, I'm sure, will really appreciate it. And, of course, you have regular Robin here who kicks ass as much as possible with us. And we have Ed Barsley mm -hmm. from Armageddon Productions. And we have Dennis Sasquatch here from Aggression, one of my favorite bands from uh, Canada, favorite thrash band from the 80s. So it's an honor to have him, too. So, um Let's just, um, you know, I'll stop my BSing and let's get started. I guess, Tommy, just let's start off with just hearing, you know, what you got, you have coming up, you know, with the re-releases and just anything else you want to kind of plug early on before we get to kind of the roundtable thing. Going. Oh, yeah, because uh, I got, I've got so much going on, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I don't even, I'm, I'm a constant juggler of time. And I, I even have a coach that works with me and whatever, because I can't even keep it all straight. But um, so it looks like the Tales of Terror ju just came out, remastered with um, what five variants on the vinyl, um, and some of that. I actually, uh, I know one of them sold out. I mean, before it even got out, awesome. it was already gone. So uh, we were real happy about that, and that had uh, some bonus tracks on it that came out of my cassette tapes that were uh, the Scream in the Night cover from Exciter. Oh, I was so awesome. happy to find that because we did it just for the heck of it, just to enjoy ourselves at practice. And when I found it, 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 it was recorded on a Radio Shack, a realistic cassette. There were two <laughs> microphones okay. in the room, and that was it. That was all it was. I was like, this is pretty clear. I think I want to put this <laughs> out. Uh, you know, so so that that came out. That was on history also, but I, it was a favorite one. So doing that, and then upcoming, we've got um, – I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I'm trying to kind of push for the same thing for death and insanity. So I'm combing through lots of videos and um, cassette tapes again. And this is, uh, this is at Penn State in 4 1787. So I'm looking for death and insanity era stuff. The teen center in Bel Air, Maryland. We played in Penn State. We came in and there was a bunch of kids and karate outfits going hi -ya! when we opened the door and i was like <laughs> we're playing here that was crazy awesome. and then uh also in that era i don't have this i just i just found this in my book 12 21 86 the grunge club middletown new york there we go with caligula ethrash and hallow's eve oh that's a great bill too that's I'm a great bill <laughs> what was it what was, what was, was it that? everything what, um, what was that? What was that date again, Tommy? Twelve. What did I say? Twelve. Oh gosh. Well, in a, let's see. Uh, twelve twenty one eighty six. Oh, that's okay. December. That's twenty one December eighty six. For anybody. Okay. So yeah, a little bit of a little over a year after I opened, you guys were in there. Yep. And uh, it, right. Right, around the, right around the holiday season there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was actually <laughs> around the time I think I seen you at Lemoore's with. Um, <clears throat> was it anthrax and crumb yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That. I think that was that might have been 12 1986 i actually that was 12 19 right here in york pennsylvania 12 18 i've got those two right there and um uh, so this is gonna be real interesting to go through i've got just miles of tape to go through it's ridiculous i've got some now there was a moment okay when stacy anderson stopped being in hallow's eve a month later we finally got that second guitarist we'd been looking for for three years and it was james murphy who uh -huh. went on to death and then testament and some other yeah. things so there's some writing tapes of me and david stewart from hallow's eve and james murphy and i haven't heard those i'm like what's on here 
I and wow. then after I said that, I'm like, so what? What's on here that might have went on to something else? <laughs> that That's very cool. Yeah, it's true, right? I'm really wow. curious to hear what's on those. I'm sure it'd be boring for other people to us standing around playing a note, playing a few notes, then say, no, 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 like this, like this. No, 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 like this, like that's probably what it is, you know, it's a lot of that. Us metal but, junkies would love that's to That's going to be some like curious that. stuff. But right now, uh, I guess to, to get it out of the way for right now, what I'm doing is um, I have a lot going on with Black Duma Records, and that's my little humble little label. And I t it tends to be lean towards doom, but there is some thrash. Like right now, I've got out um, Grave Huffer, uh, Drift Into Black's about to come out. Dayglow Morning just released today, and they've done really well. And I recently got an international uh, distribution deal. Oh, great. And from I, I was just talking to them about an hour ago, and it, it looks like I've act, the shipment that hadn't even got there yet has already ordered out. So I need a new PO already. The reason it doesn't, I was like, why doesn't it show that this is in the stores when I go to the stores and just says it's not there. And he said, it's already gone. That's why I went, Oh, I thought it was bad. And he goes, no, 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 it's good. That's good. <laughs> you need yeah, more. Great. Okay. Well, so I'm doing good. I thought I was doing bad. You just can't tell when you're sitting, you know, here yeah. in your little desk, you don't know what's going on. So you had to, you know, I had to ask. So I'm doing the label, and uh, then my own, my own band, Tommy Stewart's Direwolf, which is me and whatever drummer I get. Um, <laughs> this uh, I have our second full album coming out because of the pandemic. Some people could or couldn't record with me and whatever, so I ended up having five different drummers on the album. It's a two-piece band, just me on vocals and, and bass, and a five-piece band. So that's coming out. Um, Resale will be during June, July, and August. It'll be released in September. I hope to do shows in uh, in fall. And probably the drummer I'm using on most of those, I have to do a little plug for my little buddy, Patrick Salerno from Grave Next Door. <laughs> you probably can't even see that stuff. But <laughs> anyway, he's my buddy, and he's going to be doing a lot of the shows away from home. And Dennis Reed, who does a whole, I've done like five different albums with him and different bands. He'll probably do some of the closer shows. So um, that's what I'm doing on that. I can't wait for that album comes out. I'm very excited about it. I wish we were playing it right now. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, how you think your new album is going to be awesome. You hope everybody else does. So anyway, I'm doing all that. And uh, I'm going to have Mont Doom. Do you know the artist Mont Doom? Oh. He did the, he did the cover for the album. Okay. Um, he he does a lot of albums, and um probably and I usually use uh for a promo guy I usually use do RPR and that's probably who's going to be handling the album. He's got a podcast with Matt Bacon called Dumb and Dumbest that I listen to a lot. <laughs> cool. I listen to two. I listen to that one and uh Monica Struts being in a band. Both of those are really good for any band to be listening to. <clears throat> So that's what all I got going on, I guess. And that that's, was my hat. Like a lot. That was my plug hat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so great to see you, Dennis. Yeah, man. Yeah, we're Been actually speaking. <laughs> yeah. So great. Still, I, I met you. The first time we met in person was August 17, 1985. I know. And we actually know the date because I still remember the date. Do you still have the shirt from the show? I know that not only doesn't fit, but it's it's been like uh, trash a long time ago. Um, but, yeah, Alozi was opening for Slayer Exodus and Metal Church in Montreal at yeah, the uh, Agent uh, Steel Record Open Festival. Yeah. But we met you outside. You told me I didn't quite remember it exactly, but I knew I'd met you all then. I knew who Aggression was. <laughs> Yeah, like I think uh, I think Johnny Hart uh, who used to have like Metal Ko magazine back then, like introduce uh, each other. Uh, right, that was my connection to you. <clears throat> yeah, because you and I used to like uh, be like pen pal and send like each other's like cassettes and stuff. Because um, yeah. I still uh, I still have like the demo, the nineteen eighty four demo that you mailed me, like from Atlanta. I just found one. I didn't even know I had one. I just yeah. found one this week. <laughs> And uh, I was so, I was like I actually have one, and somebody has offered me 
money for this and i'm like no because it's the only <laughs> one i got i said no can't I touch can't. that stuff can't touch that stuff oh no, it's my personal everything it's i only have the one so no yeah, maybe if i had two i like money i'm not going to be embarrassed of that <laughs> <laughs> no there's nothing wrong with that no i have a label i mean i do care about art and i do care about the artists and all that but i also you know we <laughs> As I'm always saying, you know, the grocery store doesn't take promo bucks. I want to get paid. <laughs> Can't give them some promos? No. Yeah. They, you know, they say, well, think of the promotion. I'm like, it, there'd be, there better be some amazing freaking a lot of people at this show if I'm not going to not get paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's, I, I that's, really, want to get paid that's really cool. You should, you should get paid for your work. <laughs> yeah, of course. Get paid yeah, for it. Course. I'm never embarrassed of that. I'm always about the art first, but we... I have to make it work in order to continue making the art. Oh, of course, yeah. I yeah. mean, if you if you don't get paid, you can't be you can't keep doing the art because it just, yeah, I can't steal know, gas all across America every time in order <laughs> to keep the tour going. Yeah, of course. And in the old days, that that happened. <laughs> <laughs> we would just pull up, and get gas, and leave. There were no cameras back then. We just pulled up and left. We didn't care if it cost. We just did it. That's how we got around. <laughs> Awesome. This is, awesome. I'm talking like 85 and 80. This is way back. I would never do that now. I but can't get away with that now. Cook, you know, we, <laughs> we went in grocery stores and ate and walked back out. <laughs> Stuff like that. We were, we were funny. I, I look back on it now. I go, it, it, I wonder how many bands did this stuff or was it just us? <laughs> yeah. We, I think all, all of our bands, we did really um, crazy things back then, you know, especially when you yeah. we stayed in every campground across America. Older. Yeah. That's how we saved money. We stayed in campgrounds. Yeah, oh. that's a, that's always. We a we were having a and we'd have an RV pulling a trailer, and then pull into a campground. We'd look across the campground. There'd be another band over there doing the same thing. I, I think I saw a Zodiac Mind Warp in the whatever whatever what was that? Those guys they were in a campground once at the same time we were. And I was like, see, we're not the only ones doing this. <laughs> what was that guy? I can't remember. Zodiac Mind Warp. Yeah, I remember the band, of course. Yeah, yeah. They were they were over on the other side of a campground once. <laughs> awesome. And I was like, see, we're not so stupid. Because if we it's not that we weren't getting paid, we just wanted we actually wanted to keep the money if possible, so we didn't spend it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You have bills when you come home anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we like when we got five hundred dollars, we'd go get a fourteen dollar campground site. <laughs> yeah. And say, okay, well, you know, we we're hoping to take this money and parlay it into uh, some interesting merch or whatever, and to continue the whole thing. We might not get to take any home, but we want to make things have be better quality for people and, and whatever. Yeah. No, of course. Hat day. Is it cold up there <laughs> where you are? Or where I am? Or, or I, yeah. no, all you. Let's see who's. No, Rob, I'm, I'm Rob, actually Rob, sweating. Here's <laughs> yeah, 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 Robin's in Florida, so. Yeah, I'm really like, you know, we're like 70 and I have the uh, air on. I have the I, air and my fan on. I'm, I'm I walked my today. dog out on the trail this morning and it was 13 degrees. No. It, it, it's cold up here. Yeah, yeah. And we got snow and I think we're supposed to get a snow, ice, and freezing rainstorm from Saturday yep. night to Wednesday, they're saying. It's 81 degrees here. Dennis, <laughs> nice. you, Dennis it must be cold where you are, right? Dennis, it's very cold where you are, right? My wife is somewhere well, down usually in, in Vancouver, it's usually not pretty mild, like because we're on the oh, west. Okay. But uh, today, like it's like actually the coldest Vancouver has been in 115 years. Yeah. <laughs> really? Just for just for Tommy. <laughs> I, I like the cold, but I, I do, I do, I, I prefer the cold. I don't know why I live in Georgia. It's, I'm just That's from why you like cold because you live down there. Life, and I'm just used to it. It's where it's home. I'll never move from this house. I just run everything from here. But uh, yeah. weather-wise, this is not where I belong, really. <laughs> awesome. Well, we let's start always with kind visit. of the roundtable thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess we'll start with Robin. Since with me, no. No. I'm no, uh, I try that when I host <laughs> when I run the show, and it doesn't usually work. So I know better now. Okay, you want? Uh, I can go first. What the hell? I'll do it. Can you turn um, up your microphone just a tad, though? Okay, yeah. It's okay. A, yeah a, after the Man of War episode, what a couple days ago, I feel manly enough where I could go first for sure. You know, 
have that confidence. <laughs> but um, okay, well, um, yeah. As far as like my favorite songs, it's really tough because man, Death and Insanity and the Tales of Terror both just such amazing albums. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's tough to really choose, but um, just just want some of my favorites off it. I think uh lethal tendencies is a great one i mean that's just such a such a killer song and and that album i think for me it's probably the my favorite uh sounding album that you did i mean i remember see, seeing what's that oh, what's that me too yeah um i think um i mean just it always brings me back when i hear that to the show that i seen at lamore's that I, I was talking about before the show with it was Anthrax and uh, Crumb Suckers, and I it just it just went over so good. I mean those chunky, heavy riffs, um, it, you know it just it's just a killer killer freaking song, and I just love the dynamics between the um, you know the kind of metal uh, clean vocals and then like the pissed off more aggressive vocals. It's it really it was really done great. Um, so yeah, that that's one of my favorites. I mean, phew, I'm trying to think what what else. I mean, um, really, the whole album's great. I mean, I'll just go with um, Goblet of Gore just because that's another really killer. But there, you can't go wrong with Death and Insanity. I mean, that's an amazing, just an amazing album. And then I think for Tale, Tales of Terror. I mean, that's you know that's the first and that's a really great one too. I mean, I think the way when that one starts off with plunging the mega death, that's just that's great. That's a great yeah. opening song, a great song. opening song by like a first band, you know, at first album by the band. It just it kill kicks your ass right from the beginning. So, you know, yeah, I mean, but the song Hollow's Eve is so good, too, on that album. I mean, both. Like I said, the first two albums are just so good that it's like it. You know, it they all it all works together like as a unit. And um, you know, like I said, when I seen you live, it just just kicked my ass. I mean, I just remember it was just a nonstop yeah, um you know, mosh pit of just head bang and insanity. It was great. It was a crazy show. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I don't need any, that's enough for me the rest of my life. <laughs> that, that's all I, I can retire now. <laughs> that, that's so awesome, man. I really appreciate it. Fun. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, you know, I was probably what I was probably 86. I was like by 16 years old, or something, somewhere wow. in that ballpark. Right. And, you were um, the target audience. Yeah. And, yeah. Was, and it, it, it like, worked because it was, it was, was it. Played on. It. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was totally amazing. Um, and I mean, as far as like a, um, a question for you, I don't really have like a specific question, but I would just like to hear some like, you know, interesting, crazy stories from, you know, just some fun stuff or crazy stuff for all that time, maybe touring. I mean, when you, I don't know the show that I seen with Anthrax and Crumb Suckers, I don't know if you were on tour with them or you're on tour with somebody else and how, how that she actually came together, but it would be, um, I'm just kind of curious on that. I think a lot, of, a lot of those shows are one off. They were me booking them. And a lot of times we toured so much that a lot of times I didn't really live anywhere. I just throw my stuff in a <laughs> public, in a storage space. Yeah. And we would be gone for a week or two weeks then we'd be home for a week. And I just kind of couch surfed until it was time to leave again. I knew I was gone again, but uh -huh. I stayed on the phone and usually it was pay phones <laughs> it was so funny when we were out so when we were out doing those shows like that they were usually one off it was me literally you could find me on a payphone outside after a show calling people trying to get more shows and putting change in there just left and right <laughs> just back then you had to use the payphone you had to use a lot of change and the calls were expensive sometimes yeah it's true yeah. it's not like today where you just call somebody you don't think of money yeah. To call somebody on your it's cell true. phone. But back then it was like, if I'm going to call Canada and try to get a job for us in uh, Toronto, I might have to spend two and a half dollars just to call somebody and then say, I can't talk right now. Call back later. I'm like, hey, <laughs> yeah. it, that, there goes a pack of baloney for everybody. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so back then you didn't have a booking agent, agent or nothing. No, we had, well, it was kind of like, I still kind of booked the same. Um, 
you might run across somebody who books in an area, say five different places if you're lucky. Yeah. They might handle two clubs, but often it was just that's the one guy we knew, or we might know three guys who book like a more. I think there were like three guys that we would talk to that would say, I can get you a show, I can get you a show. But um and sometimes Metal Blade would step in. They'd have something where for some reason they wanted us to be at it. So and it was weird at first too, because Bill Matoyer, the producer. He used to call me up with shows, so he was doing all kind of weird jack of all trade stuff for Metal Blade. In the it was, it was just super underground, really. Yeah, I mean, super like hands on underground. Everybody was just kind of doing everything. Nobody really knew what they were doing. They really yeah. did. It was just kind of all flying by the seat of your pants. Like, well, how do you go about this? Well, there is no certain way. <laughs> you just start doing stuff. Yeah. You know, and uh, but. Those, those two albums were written so closely together. I remember when we recorded, when we recorded Tales of Terror, we already had four songs that ended up on Death and Insanity. And the, the real unusual, but I mean, it really could have been one big album because when, when Tales of Terror came out, it was July uh, 12th, 1985. We, we toured, we did shows with, lots of people slayer and nasty savage mostly because there it was yeah. metal blade and by That'd april awesome. we had already recorded another album and put it out and it was just nine months later our metal blade contract actually called for us to make an album every nine months <laughs> it's like who in the heck can do that but they were <laughs> insisting on it right then that didn't really happen but it but it happened at first yeah so we um and here's here's the most unusual thing about tales of terror we never had played a show we did we played our very first show the very same day that tales of terror came out on metal blade july 12 1985 we'd never played a single show that was oh. our first show and it was local wow. <laughs> our second show ever was the montreal metal fest opening for um, slayer metal church and exodus that was our second show ever was out of the country in front of wow a couple of thousand people and with those kind of bands that was our second wow. show ever we we completely <laughs> worked backwards in our career you guys, our you band, guys look so professional like, oh, <laughs> that was and david stewart our guitarist had never even been in a band before that was his second time of being on a stage at all so it was different for me i grew up actually performing i started performing when i was four or five years old in piano stuff um nothing big but like playing silent night in a kindergarten class in front of the parents and things like that and then i was playing bass uh i played bass first time on the stage when i was 15 and uh, so i had been around doing things i'd always performed my whole life one way or the other i did child acting but uh for david that was the first time ever here i am all of a sudden he's like out there and the next show was uh at lamore with us nasty savage and slayer Wow, that was our I missed that show. one. I missed that one too. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. We didn't play. We people back home hardly knew who we were. We were already out doing all that, you know, because it was just the times. Everything was kind of clicking for, and there was like one really good band in every city. They were all a little different than each other, and they all kind of were aware of each other, but didn't know each other. You know, like I said, it wasn't like today where we have social media and all. Mm -hmm. you did become aware of each other through tape trading and seeing the little stapled together fanzines mm. that's how we all met like aggression i knew who they were you know and you'd be surprised because you go play these shows and you talk to people and they have your your album too you're like these are the people i like they have my album yeah. <laughs> wow yeah it was different uh times. those were those were really fun and magical times to, and you knew something was beginning you just knew <laughs> This was starting something. You didn't know what it was going to be, but it was something going on. Yeah, it was a magical time for the it scene was. just in general. Absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, we'll go next to uh, Steve. Hey, me. Yeah. Uh, Tommy, I think I think I I, I I said my memory's hazy. I have a hard time remembering shows from ten years ago, more or less thirty-five. <laughs> but I think I may have seen you play at Club Manhattan. In, you were there? Yeah. I remember that show. I think you were with Nasty Savage then. Yeah. Yeah. Was that Nasty that, Savage? that was a big deal for us going down there. And uh, 
There was a guy named Mark that booked some of the bands at the Grunge Club. I can't really remember his last name, but Mark Johnson, maybe, I think, was there. I, yeah, Mark Johnson. He went around with us a little bit, and he got us some shows up in the air, in Middletown and um, just stuff yeah. in the, up, what you would call it. Yeah, was, York, he, it was the Grunge York. Club, but yeah, I was at that gig in uh, Club Manhattan. Oh, yeah, Club Manhattan, which was a big rock. Harold family. Rich got us that. Harold Rich, who used to run one of the rock and roll heaven stores. Yeah, well, ha Harold Rich, uh, I saw, I was just looking at the poster that came with the reissue that we were talking about, which uh, I just got in, the rock, in rock Fantasy about a week ago or so. And there's a poster inside. And I can see one of the guys in the band wearing a rock and roll heaven north, which was right. up in Warwick, New York by me. <laughs> And I had opened, I used to be a regular customer of that store all the time with Harold and Sherry. And uh, and then I opened my store and I probably weren't real big fans of me after that a little bit, maybe because I was kind of like competition, but I did it for a reason. I was doing fairs and flea markets for years and uh, had a little store opened in 79. I was really showing my age, but uh, what the song that I'm going to pick for my number one song that really related with me and it was Metal Merchants because... I was always selling like rock stuff at the fairs and I was like, yeah, metal merchant. I'm a metal merchant. I, and Rob Robert was a metal merchant too. Of yeah, exactly. Selling shirts. And I mean, to me, well, maybe that wasn't the real meaning behind the song, but to me, that was my song. I was like, yeah, I'm a metal merchant. I'm selling backpacks, right. cassettes and records and all that stuff, you know? And, I still, uh, yeah, yeah, I love that song. I still, look at there. Whoop. Up, up, in Tommy Stewart's Direwolf, here's okay. a set list from uh, one of the, if we do a shorter set, like a yeah. 30 minute set, this is the upcoming set list and there on the bottom, I'm ending every show with Metal Merchants. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Cool, cool. Nice. Already got it in the set list. And, and, it's just a, and it's kind of weird because it's a two piece. So it's me on a distorted bass and I got to like go into like a lead and everything. <laughs> I so I had I had to kind of figure out how to play it from the guitar point of view because I was like, what is he doing in that middle part? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I, and what do you do in a lead? You gotta have the lead in there. And I'm like, what do you do with a lead when you're just the bass player? <laughs> I don't know. I just do some stuff, yeah, yeah. and it, and it, it comes out pretty cool. We do I do it different every day. And I mean, of course. But, uh, yeah, I'm gonna play that song next year. I tried to figure out a way to do lethal tendencies, but since it's a direwolf show. I didn't want to fill up. I mean, sometimes we only get to play 30 or 40 minutes and I didn't mm -hmm. want to fill it up with a seven minute song of something else. So, but I did want to, but I do a metal merchants is a three minute nod. So I said, okay, if they give us time, we're going to, we're going to play metal merchants. They got to yeah. give us 30 minutes for me to do it though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, of course, plunging the Megadeth open and open that. I mean, that's one of the, yeah. that's why a great song. And uh, you know how he wrote that? Stacy, uh, Stacy calls me on the phone. He's at his job at a t-shirt making place. He calls me, he goes, I got this great idea for a new song. He goes, it goes like this. He doesn't play guitar at the time or anything. So Stacy calls me, he goes, he goes like this. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get my bass out. And he goes, what did you just say? And he goes, no, 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 but really fast. He goes, fast you can goddamn play it. Oh, okay. So basically, I came up with something that was like chemical warfare backwards. And it was kind of like what he was saying to me. And I, and I just kept saying, is this it? Is this it? And I saw him at practice. And I said, did you mean like this? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, so I'm still not sure whether he really wrote it. <laughs> he wrote it, but I got the point of it, you know, the but that's how it was written. He'd call me up on the phone all the time with these riffs and go, do it like this. <laughs> That's yeah, how I yeah, write yeah. that stuff. I mean, how I mean the song Hollow's Eve too. It's just like kind of reminds me of like a closing how like Overkill at Overkill or Iron Maiden at Iron Maiden. It was just like that song. And I I, I mean I, it fathoms me after revisiting this album and visiting Death and Insanity back, how you guys weren't a bigger and a bigger household name in the metal business after Thanks, you know, appreciate it. I really I you really know, appreciate it's great that. To see, and, and it's great to see this album getting re-released in 2020 or 2021, wherever the hell we are now in this pandemic uh, nightmare we're living through. But uh, it's great to see your name back out there. 
and you know hopefully you can pick up so, a new generation of fans with these you know and make some noise with this reissue of the it's album. really nice that people it, you know eventually you feel like you made some kind of a mark with something you did when people mm -hmm. remember those particular three albums especially the first two and it, it's just a really good unexpected feeling that wow people remember that so i did something yeah, i've done yeah. a lot of stuff nobody ever heard of but at least I did this one you know, thing, so it's pretty cool. You know, exactly. you know, yeah. the, do you know? Yeah. Okay, that um, do you know the thing about the stop? It is not yet his time. Yeah, we will have him soon enough. Do you know who that is? No, that's Nick Jameson, the bass player from Foghat. Really? <laughs> really? He's the one oh. who engineered that was on the demo tape that and, and Valley Dolls Metal Merchants. That was the demo tape. And he was the one who engineered the demo tape. Wow. We found him in the new, in the local Creative Loafing here, the newspaper back then called Creative Loafing. And it said, and there was a musician's area, and it said um, the producer of Foghat willing to do demo tapes, 500 bucks a pop. And so I called him and said, yeah, we want to do a demo tape for yeah. 500 bucks. And that's what it was. So, but... We wanted somebody, I don't know why we thought it was cool to sound British, probably because we were Iron Maiden fans, but we asked him, I said, can you sound British and forceful? <laughs> he goes, well, I'll give it a shot. And he's, stop. I mean, <laughs> he did it. We were like, that's so cool. I just heard that song this morning, actually. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> that is awesome. That's an awesome like story. Episode. The Death and Insanity album, you got such great tracks on that too. Like uh, John had already talked about some of you know, the opening track, Death and Insanity, and uh, Suicide, D.I.E. I remember a band up here that was called D.I.E. And I'm, also, I'm wondering now in my head if they named them, got that name from your band. I don't know. It just, yep. you know, Stacy wrote it as a death and effect, and then he wanted to do the yep. D.I.E. Stacy. Me and David wrote the songs that were not, they were a little more intricate or a little weirder yeah, yeah. or experimental. Stacy's the one who wrote the ones, the six or seven songs that were catchy. He kind of had an ear for, he kind of knew what the 16 year olds wanted. He, he, he <laughs> like knew John. A, a yep. <laughs> yeah, he was your guy. <laughs> I was already, I was already like 26 when I was out. Well, th thank, I, thank him for me, okay? <laughs> I think he, I think he wrote the choruses before he filled it in with verses. And I was different. I would write, I constantly wrote lyrics, and then I would find music to fit the lyric that I had written, and then kind of adjust the lyrics a little, tweak them from there. But I think he kind of had a, a chorus idea, and then filled in the, found a riff to go with that, and then started filling in the rest of it. So well, that's, yeah. I mean, as a songwriter, I mean, as a songwriting band. That's a great thing to have people looking at it from different angles because that's how you get the, the proper dynamics in a band, you know? Yeah, that chemistry worked really good for us to. Um, so there was a little bit, you'd get your gobble to gores, but you also had your DIEs. And if it had all been gobble of gore and Hallows, the song Hallows Eve, whatever like that, I'm not sure anybody would have. The ones they really wanted to hear live were you'd, you'd walk on stage and they'd yell, Speed Freak! And I'd be like, I need one string on my bass to play it. <laughs> <laughs> and I often only had there were shows that I did do it on one string because I often we'd be running around the stage so much and hitting the string so hard on my bass that I would pop them so I had to have two pair two basses on stage sometimes four I'd sometimes get to the fourth one I carried four <laughs> and I and I remember one show in particular I got to the fourth bass Speed Freak's the last song the reason it was the last song is because we were so out of tune by that point and and strings were falling off my bass but i knew i could play that if i had one string <laughs> <laughs> so that was why it was always the last song because we maybe because we were kind of we were just our tuning was just fucked by then yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter this was almost a punk song <laughs> it didn't matter we just didn't care david will lean over and go you're not i'm out of tune and i'd go i just shrug it and go i don't care <laughs> <laughs> just play stuff <laughs> I, I guess i have one more question before i wrap up my segment but, uh so who, what was the idea behind getting the the hollows eve tales of terror reissued uh how, how did that go about and did, was that, I, I, they just contacted me 
the German. Oh, okay, good. I, I know. Brian, sorry, guy from the German uh, office contacted me and said, How, "Would you like to do this?" And I said, "He said, do Do you have a lot of? Do you have any stuff that can be used for bonus tapes, photos?" And I said, "I have some photos. We weren't big on taking photos back then. You know, it wasn't like now where everybody knows how to do Instagram photos. And Everybody's got a phone, a phone in their hand. Yeah, exactly. Like if someone happened to have a camera, or we had people send them to us sometimes. Yeah. Now, um. But yeah, he did, they contacted us. Okay, that's so, cool though. I mean, the one I've got here is a um, metal merchant leaded gray marble. Vinyl. Yeah, I named those two. I got the I metal named, merchant vinyl. I got the so metal that's good. The name of them. So it's like no rules, bloody spikes, you know, <laughs> whatever. Awesome. So, I got to name all those. I do like the gray. Uh, you know what I liked about the gray, the metal one? It looks like a piece of metal. Yeah. Gray marble. It, it looks awesome. Plain, but on the, it looks like a break disc. <laughs> I don't know if you can really see it because I live in my black light layer. So you're not really going to see the color, but there. Yeah, it can't really doesn't come out. Yeah, the see, red, the black looks spikes. looks really great. That's the one I got too. I'm in my solitude, uh, fortress of solitude, uh, rock fantasy studio bunker, whatever you want to call this room. <laughs> <laughs> studio bunker. Awesome. Well, let's go to Robin next. Oh, me. Okay. So um, I think my first introduction to the band was on uh, Metal Blade's Metal Massacre. Yes. Because I yeah. I had like all, I have like all the single ones plus the box set. So that was like my first, you know, I would always get those to like, you know, hear different bands. And I, you know, I always liked the compilation ones that came out at that time. I think it was on number six. That was a great one. Yeah, that, yeah. like that was that's really the thing. Like, I had like all kind of like like different thrash volumes that came out at that time, just to you know hear different bands and stuff. Um, yeah, and I, then, know, I, I, love I mean them. to pick a like, I don't know if I could pick songs. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say uh, "Death and Insanity," like basically the whole album for me is you know the top one <laughs> and then tales of terror and then i also i mean there's great songs on all of them and i also remember and i might be wrong but i remember like river's edge movie yeah yep. there were two songs in it, it like 19 seconds so we made a big deal out of that but it was yeah. great because i remember <laughs> hearing cool. it you know like ever, like that whole soundtrack was amazing but i remember hearing what is that Death and Insanity. Oh, yeah. Ah, that, awesome. Nice. That's sick. Yeah. Really I nice. remember yeah. like also hearing it on there. And I don't know if uh Tommy remembers, like basically from the time I met him years ago, I'd always be like, Yeah, can I get a shirt? Do you got a shirt? Are you bring me a shirt? Uh and I <laughs> like a long time ago. And I I still wear, you know, all those Eve shirts when like we played live and stuff. Like oh, thanks. I and I feel it. like, you know. That the band never got, you know, the notoriety. I feel like, you know, nothing. I'm not gonna. How can I say this without incriminating myself against bands that I work with? Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, they're awesome. You're you're with a lot of awesome bands. So. I know, but um, you know, I mean, at that time too, the focus was definitely on the West Coast. You know, yeah. and and I feel like the East Coast bands didn't get the notoriety that they should have that were so good I think I, think I enjoyed I, and you know what I mean I remember being able to go into a record that. store I'm gonna call it anvil syndrome they were kind of the same thing they were kind of isolated yeah I think it's possible that their geography of bands like anvil were uh like us we we're we were the only thing in Atlanta and there wasn't another thrash band for uh you know a six hour drive in any direction yeah. so we were kind of lost that's know? what I, I feel like people on the east coast were that like lost like it wasn't the same group camarader camaraderie i guess you as, had to get up uh, to new york to start yeah, seeing that company. yeah yeah if you're yeah. in new york i think it was a little different but anywhere outside of new york yeah new you york really kind of got overlooked France. a lot of times yeah. it was, the old bridge you know all up in there that got famous for that but, but they're yeah. all up there supporting each other people down here like i don't i like what y'all did i don't know what y'all did but i liked it <laughs> they don't even <laughs> know what i just feel this. like like hollow's eve got kind of lost in that 
shuffle at that time and i i don't feel like the band should have you know like right. especially like the at the beginning like you know to me the records were like great and stuff and you know i enjoyed them and i still do i still listen to it so we get a trophy for not good try it, it's so, uh, you it, get it more stands up though trophy. it stands up to the test of time and to yeah. even to the albums that, at that time it, it's very uh albums are at a very high level and uh forward thinking i think i i, I like the fact that they had that uh mixture of the singing vocals and kind of like the growly or lower vocals because it, it, it fit the right way it wasn't like you just did the right vocals for the right part i thought that was an, uh, an amazing um you know sure. angle to look at it you know songwriting yeah. wise i'm, just glad, I'm glad the band's still around at this point and doing stuff and you know with the reissues and everything and yay that's cool. a, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we made a very conscious effort when we were making those albums to have dynamics and to have light and shade, light and shade, quieter parts, change up the uh, rhythms or whatever. So something might be a hypnotic, but somewhere in the middle, if we were doing that, you knew we were going to, we we're going to turn the double bass on, probably turn it back off and go back to the other part. And we, we always tried to do something contrasting within the song. So like plunging, you know, it's all like, go, 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 go. There's bum, 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 bum. Live, we played all that stuff a little faster than we should have. I listened back to the stuff and I'm like, what the heck were we doing? Oh, they gave us 15 minutes to play. And we said, we're doing our set. We're doing the whole set. It's supposed to be 30 minutes to do it, but we're going to do it in 15. If that's what they're going to give us, we're going to play all, you just play it as fast as you can. We would, we go on stage. There was no like how many beats per minute. We just went at it. We just said, play it as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's then awesome. we walk up the stage and the promoter say, was that it? And I'd go, well, we, we played it too fast. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you done, Robin? Yeah, I'm done. I think I named everything. I mean, I can't. You know. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, I guess we'll go with Ed Farsity from Arbing Ganning Productions in New York. All right. Um, first time I discovered the band was Tales of Terror when it came out. Um, I don't think I had, I mean, I was getting the Metal Massacres, but I don't think I had Metal Massacre 6 yet. Um, I went to the record store. I used to go to the record store every week. Saw Tales of Terror, fell in love with the album cover, bought the import, brought it home. As soon as I dropped the needle down, I just fell in love with Plunging to Megadeth and just start to finish. It just blew me away. Um, my all-time favorite song is definitely the song Hallow's Eve. Um, to the point that when I was, was either a senior in high school or when I first started going to college, I took a journalism class and we were assigned, we had to write a music video, a detailed music video with you know, descriptions and a storyline and back and forth. And I wrote it for the song Hallow's Eve and I got an A plus on it too. So thank you very much, Tommy, for writing <laughs> amazingly nice. descriptive lyrics. You, knew, it's just, you paid attention to the story in the middle of it. Absolutely. I wrote that story. It's a story I called Routine, and I found yep. it amongst my high school stuff. It's a short story I wrote in a 10th grade creative writing class. That's why it's a, such a good story. <laughs> and, story and I, then I changed it to, you know, rhyme and fit. It was Skelly's music. We called it Skeletor. His name right, is right. You maker. It, it was his music. What he did is he handed me a cassette with a lot of riffs on it. I thought he meant it to be one big, and I said, oh, I had this one big song idea and whatever for lyrics so he handed me this cassette with all these lyrics on it. so i come to practice i go and then it does this and then it does this and then it, and he goes well, well i meant that to be like eight different songs <laughs> you put them all in one song <laughs> I, it works so great I said, oh i didn't know okay i'm i'm thinking in terms of like i listen to a lot of jethro tull you know i'm like i'm what? thinking in terms of like think as a brick or whatever but I'm like you guys. I, I got all those Metal Maskers. I loved them. I loved oh, those great albums. Were great two of my favorites. I loved Five. That was a good one. They were all the first really one great. when it first came out. Yep. <laughs> Malice and Metallica. <laughs> yeah, it had that. The story behind that one. The stories about who did what on that. That's pretty interesting stuff. In Brian's book, did you read Brian's book? No, I didn't. The history of Metal Blade. Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't got the book yet. That's a. It's a good book if you know any for um metal history right 
but it, it, talks about I, the, it talks about the metal maskers a little in depth, cool. especially the first one about how that's the bands were chosen and why people are on there and stuff it's really interesting it's a great history of early fresh metal and power metal that's for sure right yeah he talks about meeting in the parking lot of i think the country club or was it Capitol records they used to have a bunch of them they used to meet in the parking lot and have <laughs> tape trading excuse me like live you know in person nice <laughs> be so many people that they were getting run off and stuff <laughs> you know, there got to be a lot of people meeting every saturday morning in this parking lot it, it became a thing that's very cool <laughs> you know, then he did the metal massacre the one and he said it's it sold more and he goes it sold how many and he goes well looks like i got i got i guess i got a record label <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to the book it sounded like he was actually surprised hopeful but then surprised it worked it's like wow. I, I did that nice <laughs> okay, let's do another one you know and then i guess he got bitch right away yeah but anyway yeah it's a very interesting book yeah check it out i, I read uh john zazula's book lately too i did that's a great one <laughs> i haven't yeah. read that one yet either really in depth really a lot of good storytelling in there that's cool he, well, he's another one that started everything yeah, I had yeah. to make sure to read those two. Yeah. <clears throat> um, anything else, Ed? Any other uh, songs or any other questions? Um, I do have one question for you. Um, you brought up James Murphy before. Um, when I came out, when I was doing my fanzine, the Book of Armageddon, I sent Dave a copy of my fourth issue. And we corresponded back and forth for a few times. And then James, when he joined the band, he picked up the writing and started writing like four or five page letters. And he's the one that told me that Stacy left, told me about you know, a few different things happening with the band, described some of the new songs that you were just talking about trying to find. I don't have any recordings, unfortunately, either. Um, but I do have a question. How come at that time you decided to add the second guitarist with James, as opposed I mean, to just actually, having Dave? I was, personally, I was against adding it. I like one guitarist. Right. Um, I, to me, it's just me. I personally like playing with less instruments. I like hearing everything very clearly and I'm a bass player. So I don't really want to get buried with a bunch of guitar. Yep. That's part of my, you know, yep. then, <laughs> makes sense. the other thing is I, I think that the second guitar, it is an awesome sound when both of them are rhythms, but almost unnecessary. It's just a tunnel of noise and um, a good noise, but it seems like to me, the only reason they have two guitars is for the harmony aspect of it. So we went around and around about this, but the entire time that after Skelly left, after recording Tales of Terror, we actually looked for a second guitarist all the time. Mm. We just never found anybody. Oh, really? <laughs> out. We uh. actually were trying to, well, I was always against it, but went along with it. But so we had many people out. One guy, and speaking of Fog Hat, one guy went and came and auditioned for us. We turned him down and he went and joined Fog Hat. <laughs> I don't know why there had to be this fog hat connection. It just I happened. didn't know there. Yeah, I didn't know there was a big fog hat. Uh, know, what's the Hallows deal? Eve connection. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't either it just kept it popping up together. Here here. <laughs> we, we kept having all kind of weird connections, and then uh, like uh, my daughter was pointing out, uh, we used to rehearse into this place that was a a small studio, and there were three girls in there doing a demo tape. I had my daughter with me. She had to come to practice and she sat in the lobby and played with little plastic dinosaurs. And I asked one of the little girls when she wasn't doing her vocal tracks, I said, she, they were about 16, 15 or whatever. And I said, would you go in there and watch my daughter when you get a chance and just make sure she's okay? And she said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Well, it turns out that group was called TLC. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> sat my daughter while we rehearsed. Nice. <laughs> So there was a little bit of a TLC connection too. And also our drummer, Tom Knight, who was did the monument touring with us. When he left us, he went to TLC. He is the, the all time, long time drummer of TLC. He came from Hallow's Eve. Wow. <laughs> and to be fair, he played with a lot of Atlanta um, people like that. He was actually working for the producers. I believe that was Dallas Austin and Babyface, those guys. Anyway, so all the Atlanta R&B people kind of had the same couple of drummers and Tom Knight, our drummer. That's what he went on and did. Okay. So we were a merry-go-round. We had James <laughs> spinning off to death. We had a, Tom spin off to TLC. And so we had some people <laughs> leaving us and going to better things. I began to feel like we were this merry-go-round of like, well, if we could ever keep anybody here for five minutes, 
but James, yeah. Um, and then what happened is we just simply couldn't find somebody to replace Stacy that was perfectly right. And James got a call from Chuck and he said, come on down. And mm. James just went yeah. to death. He, well, he gave us about, I think he was with us for about four to six months, something like that. That's what I figured, something like that, yeah. Very short, long enough to, then when he got a call to do something that was going to happen, he went, well, if y'all can't find a singer, then I'm gone. I don't well, know. <clears throat> I'm not sure how that would have come out, but. Yeah, you guys didn't do any recording was, together, really, good. right? Huh? You guys didn't record anything, just the rehearsals you mentioned earlier, well, right? All these rehearsal tapes yeah. I recently found. I'm like, what's on there? <laughs> him playing there's got to be some stuff of him playing our stuff on there sure with two guitars where there were one i really want to hear this stuff it's all awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well we look forward to it a full there might be a full song there i wonder if, if there is i wonder if it could be enough for a bonus track on the that definitely sounds like a good bonus track if james would say that's okay i, I wouldn't put it out unless i called him and Ask James him. is James is cool. He, I would yeah, say that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I mean, back then when I would talk to James, he's always very proud of working with Hollow's Eve. So yes, he was. Yeah. I mean, I. Oh, you know, funny. he always mentioned it. So yeah, sure we cool. had something to remember it by. But he was he was <laughs> there. It almost happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, well, well, thanks, Ed. I appreciate it. And I guess we'll go to Dennis next, and from Aggression. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you can, maybe pick up some of your favorites and just, you know, I know you have some crazy stories because you were a maniac. See, we would try to get him now. That's who <laughs> we would get. That would be the guy. If we were to go out and do the music of Hallow's Eve, that's who I would call. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, Aggression, uh, we used to be a huge fan of Hallow's Eve. Um, like, Bad Day, we used to cover, like, Plunging to Megadeth. We used to cover There Are No Rules. We used to cover metal merchants, um, so we were huge. And still, like even on our latest uh, aggression record, we do have a song called "Tales of Terror," uh, which is entirely dedicated to Tommy and Hallow's Eve. Um, and all the lyrics from oh, that wow. song are coming from uh, stories from all the the Hallow's Eve songs. So when John asked me to come and talk about Hallow's Eve, it was going to be way too easy for me to. to, to <laughs> talk about Hallow's Eve but yeah we we uh <clears throat> we were huge fans uh we still are um and I guess for us like um you know like I, I was thinking about picking songs that I like my favorite song but um in the end it's not that complicated to 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 pick um because personally my favorite song is the song Hallow's Eve um uh, and it's the song I got in the demo, the first song I ever listened to. And, and you have to like remember back then, like our imagination was like picturing the band in like a different light because we didn't we didn't know the guys, we didn't know like we didn't know it was their second show ever in Montreal. Like we think they're like professionals and like they've been doing this for years, right? right? But um, so you have that like wah wah guitar, like wow 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 wow, right? And it. it uh, Prowler has all, always been my favorite like maiden song and and I I, I think I, I had that same vibe with that start but the song Allo's Eve has like so many different movements uh, and Aggression was never able to cover it because we're not that great as, as musicians but it, it's it's you know you had like the logo you had like the band the pictures um, and the first time I ever seen the guys in Allo's Eve and their promo pic in the fanzine like uh, black and white they look like creepy like from atlanta like weird freaking people right we were weird people like barbarians or <laughs> it something. wasn't from the clothes but we were pretty weird <laughs> but it, it, you have it all worked. there's a lot of stuff i cannot tell <laughs> those are the good it, stories yeah it, it all worked uh it all worked for us and um and then when we got the uh the tales of Terror album like we started to like cover like like I said, and for us, like Aloe's Eve um, was part of like same as like Slayer and Metallica. And like there was no difference for us. It was just like one of those band we used to listen just as much as Metal Militia or Bonded by Blood or Plunge into Megadeth. It was it was one of the, the big band at the time. Um, then something happened. And I, and I don't know like how to explain it, but 
I'll just tell the story and then you guys can have fun with it. But so I'm a huge Alozi fan and like I got Tales of Terror. I know like that ins insanity is about to come out, but like I don't have it and like I'm, you know, looking forward to go and buy it, but I know it's coming out. So I go into this bar in Montreal and like these girls dancing to this awesome riff and I'm like, what is this band? And like, and I, like, you know, there's like a, a Celtic Frost kind of vibe to it, a bit of SOD. And um, and then I, I, I go to the DJ and I'm like, what is this freaking band, right? And he goes, it's Alu's Eve. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's not Alu's Eve. And he's like, yeah, it's a song called Lethal Tendencies. So at one point, like Alu's Eve was like playing in like, kind of like dance rock bars. <laughs> <laughs> where like people were dancing to like Lethal Dendencies and B.I.E. and all these songs. Um, you can get the so whole that... so it's kind of yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, uh, like... I can see it, though. Yeah, Montreal, was... Montreal is very European in its feel of discos and whatever, you know. Yeah, people were dancing to Procreation of the Wicked, right? So, like, uh, exactly. I, say, I wish that was in my town back in those days. We didn't have anything as cool as that in Middletown. Girls dancing yeah. to Hollow's Eve and Celtic Frost. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely like, um, um, you know, so like, off Tales of Terror, Hollow's Eve always going to be my, my, my favorite song, followed by. Man, I'm so glad because that was my favorite one off of it, too. Yeah, that's the one where I felt like I'd actually accomplished something in the studio where I'd gotten everybody in the band to actually play the part. So I sat there with Stacy and only that song, all the other songs, he did his own arrangement on that one. I said, do this and then go, hello, Eve. And he go, hello, Eve, the way he does so great. And I, but I actually kind of directed the band. I felt like what I wanted to happen really happened. And I got to, you know, produce it as far as the arrangement goes. And so I'm, I'm glad people like it so much because that I really put a lot into that one, into the arrangement. Well, if I go back to listen to Gallo, it's always the first song I'll put on. And then after that, I, I go and listen to everything. But it was, like, was, was yeah. my, it, it's still my favorite. I'd love to have heard you play it. I'm sure you can play it now. Ah, that was back in the days. Yeah, <laughs> better than back in the days. That's I've heard sure. you play a lot. You can play anything, man. <laughs> uh oh, he froze on us. Uh oh, yeah. It's too cold there. Yeah. That was, was it too cold there? That was it. <laughs> no. It's the coldest it's ever been in 100 and some years, he said. I don't know. <laughs> He's got the long distance award, Vancouver. That's a long way. There you go. Okay, you froze. Okay, You're there you are. You froze, froze for a second. For a minute. It's freeze. so cold. Everything, everything froze. <laughs> <laughs> what's the next aggression um, move i'm kind of curious if what what's the next aggression move i'm curious oh man aggressions always have moves <laughs> but yeah. um, uh, but uh, i think like um um i just want to say one story uh, before we talk about if you okay. want to hear something about aggression like um so at that show in montreal like uh, uh with slayer exodus metal church i was actually supposed to be megadeth and exciter playing um, but some something happened, like Megadeth and Exciter got kicked off the bill, and then uh, Agent Steel and Aloe's Eve like were were added to the bill to the bill. Um, and I was like 18, 19 years old at the time, and uh, you know, I, I somehow like Stacy Aloe's Eve singer um, was got me backstage, and I was all like, you know, seeing like Tom Araya and like you know all these guys. I was all excited, right? But uh, so I get backstage and then David Stewart, the guitar player, is like he's having like an acoustic guitar or, or like um, just an acoustic guitar. And he's playing acoustic guitar with like Jeff Enneman and Gary Holt, like looking at him play. And he, the guy's playing like freaking Steve Howe, like, yeah. like amazing, amazing stuff. And like, I don't think many people know how good David was. Dave as a real player. good. Dave was a classical guitar student who kind of fell into being in a metal band. I, he he wasn't really even that into the metal stuff. He listened to it, but yeah. And that's why we put the one thing obituary. Uh, I asked David if he could write a small original piece on, and play it on a 
proper classical guitar to put it on the album. I said, I think it would be just good to show people that you can do this. So that's what the, the little song obituary, that's what that's about, yeah. is him showing, you know, I actually can play. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I'm not surprised you caught him backstage doing something like that. That's a, that's really where his heart was. Is you know, just seeing like Jeff Hanneman's like jaw, like looking like that guy like, actually can't play. Like, yeah. What is he doing? Like that guy can actually really play, right? And he's doing these like Steve Al, like crazies, you know, like that's yeah. who he would play along with at home. Is people like um, Eric Johnson and. Um, yeah like you said just just people who were not really in metal they were in jazz rock and things like that that's what the records he would sit and play with so he was very good and a lot of his riffs he would have to come and sit down with me and lick by lick say it goes like this that little bit he'd be doing something that i i see what he's doing i hear what he's doing but he's the fingering would be backwards from anything i'd done and i would have to learn a new thing to do and i'd be i can't and he'd go do it again and it'd be hours of this and he would make a little cassette and I would take it home and I would put it on a cassette player that you could slow down and you'd have to retune your pitch. And then I would go very slowly and I'd come back the next day and he'd go, I'd say, okay, let's, let's work on that part. And he'd go, well, I changed that. <laughs> oh, I just got it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was, I was, I didn't like doing all that work, but it was paying off and making me a better player the whole time. So I tolerated it. Because, you know, if you play with people who are better than you, you get better. And he was better than me. So, and I kind of, you know, it's tough, but that's kind of good for you if you're a musician. Play, play with people who are as good or better than you, not the ones who aren't as good. You, you want to be better. So, same thing with, I think, with personalities, everything. You are who you surround yourself with. So, I just believe that. That's so cool, man. I love that song, too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan of that song, too. That's cool. So Aggression's got a new album coming out? I'm just wanting to know. Yeah, I'm just working on stuff using this, uh, this like, confinement uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, like, you know, we were, we're listening song our entire life about pandemic and stuff like that. But, like, you know, some of us are having a hard time adjusting to it. But, no, we're just using that downtime, like, writing songs, recordings. Uh, Me too. We should have something coming out uh, in this year for sure. So I'm just having yeah, fun. I didn't, it didn't bother me a bit to be isolated. I got a lot of work done. <laughs> wow, that's it, right? I, I spent the whole time up. working. I, my entire next album that's coming out that I told you about this summer, pre-sale, blah, blah, blah. I, that's what I recorded during that time. And when I couldn't get a drummer, I played the drums myself. I'm playing, I added <laughs> drums on two unfinished drum tracks. That I couldn't get the drummer to come back and then there's one song where I I just didn't have a drummer and I said you know what there's a drum set back there I have a studio and I went I sat down and said okay I'm gonna play drums for I'm not gonna learn how to play all drums but I'm gonna learn how to play this song so I sat down and figured out how to do it and for the first time ever so there's a drum track coming out where I'm the only drummer and I sat at a set recorded it myself which was really weird because every time I had to start over, I had to get up and come over here and push three again. <laughs> so, I, so me doing a, I didn't want to do another take because I'd have to get up and come over and stop it. And I have to start it way ahead and make entire like a 12 other tracks just to catch up to the, it was insane. And then I got a keyboard where I could do it from a remote. That got a lot better. But I ended up doing a track by myself. So I am the drummer on one of the tracks and I'm not a drummer. So I guess I am. Cause I did it, and there it is. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. awesome. It re actually uh, made me remember. Did uh, you jam with a drummer called Clay Lytle? The name sure is familiar. Just because he jammed with us for just like a, I think one show, and it was like a fest we were doing, and he mentioned to me that he was jamming with you guys. I don't know if maybe he was just going to be jamming with you guys but i was just curious if, if it... you were always changing drummers too so <laughs> officially in 30 years we had 11 drummers yeah this was like in a, like 90 99 or 98 or something like that That's... I, I i can't remember but uh, okay i was just curious about that yeah, but i didn't know what was going on in those in those years <laughs> i was popping around we were i was playing with skelly and 
we were trying to do a Lestragus Nosferatus thing. We were trying to do a possibly a Hallow's Eve thing. We were, I think we were all kind of fishing around right then about what to do because metal had sort of dissipated in the lower echelons of Atlanta yeah. local scene. And so we were kind of fishing around like, what are we going to do? Because the 90s, it really kind of went downhill for everybody for a little while. Yeah. You know, metal stuff. Yeah, no, definitely at that that time, metal was at a kind of an all time low, especially for like traditional metal and even thrash yeah. and stuff. Like, if you were kind of like you went way underground during that time. Yeah, yeah. But um, okay, well, I guess we should probably get close to wrapping this up. Is there any other uh, questions or points that anybody wants to bring up? Uh, anything before we go? No, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, 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 no, but I love meeting all you guys and, and talking yeah, to you. Same here. Awesome. Is there on Facebook and we comment on each other's stuff a little bit. I see you a lot more than I actually comment. I'll be <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, cool. thank you very much for uh, being on the show. Yeah, and I definitely. Guess, it was an honor. I guess Steve, Steve could yeah. take us out. And thanks, John, for setting this up. John's been a real help as I've started this, uh, you know, Rock Fantasy Files YouTube channel during the pandemic just to help promote my store rock fantasy in middletown new york and uh we've been here for 35 years heading for 36 and uh just it's been uh, it's been something that's really turned into something nice lately and i appreciate john's help and grabbing some guests and robin has grabbed a lot of guests for us too and and hopefully some of you guys and you know ed i i've been thinking of contacting you ed too and then when john said hey i talked to ed about coming on i said i think that was a perfect perfect fit so uh, I, I just i just this okay. is really cool yeah, yeah i just knew ed was such a fan especially of that era and stuff because i remember from back in then so i knew he was the right person oh yeah same with dennis <laughs> too so uh please uh if you like what we're doing on the channel please take a moment and subscribe and uh Please check out. We'll have a link on here so you can check out some of Tommy's music. We'll make sure that that stuff is on uh, in, in, in the uh, details uh, on the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll be back with some more episodes soon. Actually, later this afternoon, we'll be taping a Killers, uh, Iron Maiden Killers 40th anniversary episode. Oh, wow. Nice. I'm going to subscribe to this channel. I didn't know. <laughs> now I see. This is awesome. Next week we'll be revisiting. We'll be visiting Pink Floyd uh, next week on an episode, and we will also nice. be uh, work uh, doing an episode on Ozzy Osbourne and his solo career. We we had just put one out on Black Sabbath of the Ozzy era, and we had a Black Sabbath uh, Dio era a couple of weeks ago, which really did well for us. So uh, we've got more going on, and John's got a couple projects coming up too, but that he he can maybe fill us in real quick, and then we'll. Well, uh, well, yeah, I have an interview with Jeff Bezerra from Possessed coming up soon. And um, I think we're doing one on a Swedish death metal uh, scene, yeah. like the early 90s one. Uh, but a couple yeah. others, things I can't think of right now. But There'll be more coming up, so yeah. uh, keep keep uh, tuned in. And we've got the Rock Fantasy Instagram, Rock Fantasy Record Shop on Instagram. And uh, thanks for joining us. And Tommy, it's, it's great to reconnect after... <laughs> Great. So many years with you. All right. Yeah. Thank well, you all you guys. Okay. Awesome, Appreciate you guys coming here and doing this. Later. Thank you guys. <laughs>